Okay, I will start just of from the from how it will proceed as for now. Uh, we, it will you will have about forty to forty five, even forty five or fifty minutes for the talk, and then we will have about ten minutes for the questions. And then if it's fine with you, then we will end the formal part. And those who want to stay will be able to stay with us for about ten to fifteen min more minutes for additional questions and discussion is it fine mm -hmm. with you great yeah, very good. so i will proceed with a very short introduction of professor Coti gonzalez she's a prominent scholar who, who have published in many top journals what i have not known about Coti is that she's a great inspi inspirer she ha she has mentored more than 30 postdocs many of whom decided to proceed with a successful academic career so I'm sure she, her talk will inspire us as well. So now, Koti, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to talk to you about this topic because a lot of the work I do um, has connections to cybersecurity these days. And the topic I'm gonna talk to you about is not directly connected to cybersecurity. So I was so happy to have the opportunity to talk about basic research on binary choice problems uh, today. And um, the work I'm presenting today is really has been um, performed by postdocs, students, undergraduate and graduate that have been part of my lab in the past. Erin McCormick was my PhD student. Manos Constantinidis and Jason Harmon were uh, postdocs that are professors now. And Sam Shayet was uh, an undergraduate student in my lab who now is at Berkeley as a PhD student. So interestingly, even though this work is sort of old, um, the papers, the two papers came out this year. And um, they came out in the same journal, Memory and Cognition. So they are sort of uh, companions, uh, companion papers. So in this presentation, I put together the two papers because both of them are about um, choice adaptation in binary uh, choice tasks. So let's, uh, let's talk about change. So um, this famous grip philosopher Heraclitus um, had this quote that I really like, no man ever steps in the same river twice. Um, and this is because he was fascinated with the ever permanence of, of change. Uh, indeed, I am too interested in um, how things change in our world and more importantly, how our decisions contribute to that change. So when we, go through life, we don't have really a full set of um, decision trees in front of us, ahead of us, but rather we sort of walk this path and we discover those different um, branches that we have to go through. So those paths really reveal themselves as we move forward in life. And so we, what, what that says is we really make decisions uh, under uncertainty and under risk all the time. And the environment changes continuously and we contribute to the change in that environment. In fact, most, most environments are dynamic. If you think about almost any task that I can think of changes over time. So in the decisions that we need to make need to be adjusted to that change. So firefighters, um, uh, when they are trying to assign um, the different crews to different parts of the fire, um, they are making dynamic decisions. When you are driving, you are making dynamic decisions. Uh, but let me for now to make a connection directly to binary choice uh, give you a simpler example of a dynamic decision, which is shopping online versus shopping in the store. So 
So if you think about uh, 10 to 20 years ago, nobody thought of shopping online, right? So we all were shopping in the store. Um, and for many reasons, um, shopping online, the technology was not available and little by little, gradually, the technology became more available. And uh, we started to transition from shopping in the store to shopping online. Um, for many reasons, now shopping online is perhaps the best option for, for all of us. So we have gradually transitioned from selecting this option to selecting um, the online shopping over time. In fact, sort of the pandemia um, helped in making that ship more rapid, right? Because we had no choice but shopping online. So um, we individuals need to track those changes in the environment and adapt to those uh, choices over time so that we can make the best uh, out of the environment and our decisions. So these kind of problems um, have been studied in decisions from experience, of course, as binary choice problems. And in the binary choice paradigms that we all know about, we have looked at uh, choices between two, um, two alternatives. The main point has been to look at the contrast between decisions from experience and decisions from description. So we know that in decisions from description, we are presented with the explicit value of the two alternatives. And in decisions from experience, we are presented only with two buttons, blank buttons. And the values of those buttons are discovered um, with the selection of those buttons, right? So the, um, the selection of the, the button makes the distribution realized or the outcome realized. And we um, then become aware of what the outcomes of the different alternatives are. Now, there are uh, different paradigms of these DFE uh, decisions from experience, and these are only a few of them, but probably the most important ones. One of them is the sampling paradigm. And we know that in this case, we have a sampling phase and then a choice phase in which only the last choice is consequential. Um, but these uh, other paradigms are um, interesting too, in the sense that each of the decisions are consequential themselves and the number of times that we make a choice is fixed. Um, we also, uh, you know, people have investigated the partial and full feedback uh, provided uh, a lot too. So in the partial feedback, we only know the outcome of the option we have selected. And in the full feedback, in addition to knowing that outcome, we also know the foregone payoff, that is the outcome of the, of the option that we didn't select and what we would have gotten had we selected that other option. So, Although there has been quite a lot of work on decisions from experience in the past two decades since the first paradigm in 2003 by Ido and uh, Greg Barron came out. Um, interestingly, most of this research has been done in static environments. What that means is that the outcome distribution doesn't change over time. Uh, there are some exceptions, and here I'm going to highlight only two to frame the studies that we did. So the first one is uh, by Racco and Myler. Um, this, I, I thought, was a very inspiring uh, paper for me. Um, what they did is basically they um, designed six different games. And in these different games, they, um, this is a binary choice task. They had two options. One option was stationary, provided the high outcome with the same probability all the time. The other option was non-stationary, provided the high outcome with varying shapes of the probability, let's say. So in this case, 
it was, let's say, 0.90, I don't know exactly the value, but 0.90 fixed, and then it decreased over time, and then it was fixed again, et cetera. So this point, the point of crossing of these two lines is the shifting point. Uh, that is, is a point in which the objective value of the two options changes, right? And therefore, we can take a look at whether people adapt their choices to the best alternative after the change. What they did is um, they had a couple of experiments, but as you can see, these, these different uh, games uh, vary in many different ways. So we can see some trends are going down, some trends are going up, right? Some trends uh, change suddenly, and in some others, they change gradually. So there was no control really over the gamble, the games they use, it was just a bunch of ex interesting examples. So what they found is that individuals adapt their choices slowly because they uh, explain um, stickiness meaning that they tend to select whatever was best at the beginning of, of the task. So the initial experiences would influence the choices, the future choices and inhibit adaptation. They also observe a trending or a trend effect. That is, they observe that people adapt to the choices that become less rewarding over time, like these ones then choices that become more rewarding over time than these ones. This was just an observation because they really didn't control for that, right? And they, they did not have foregone. I'm sorry? They had partial feedback? Uh, I, I will cover that later. They had, had full feedback in this case. Full feedback? OK. Yes. So, I'm sorry, someone else? Okay. The other example I'm going to show here is by uh, the Leharaga brothers and me back in 2014. Uh, what we wanted to do in this case is to take those same six problems of Racco and Myler and study uh, how groups adapt to change versus individuals. So, um, what we did or what we found is that although groups are better than individuals before the change, they actually adapt worse than individuals after the change. Uh, but we can see that only in more clearly only in this problem. So this graph shows the proportion of maximization of groups versus individuals before the change and then after the change. And so we can see that groups are better than individuals before, but then individuals are better than groups after, right? But the part Probably, of the and your uh, and your uh, group were just three people sitting in front of one computer, correct? And talking about it uh, naturally. Yes, correct. Yeah. So uh, that pattern is not as clear in these two problems, right? So what we uh, believe is that there is, again, a trend effect. That is, uh, the difference only happens when there is this um, decreasing, but not this increasing um, trend. So what we did also in this paper is that through cognitive models, uh, we fit it uh, to individuals and to group, individual groups. And we looked at the recency parameter of this model to see whether that could explain the difference in adaptation. And we found that indeed, um, individuals had a higher recency parameter than the groups did. So we believe that recency is important for adaptation. But this, this um, study, again, the goal was different, was to look between groups and individuals and therefore, the question is still out there where, whether, you know, recency is, is important. 
Uh, the question that Ido brought up, the partial and full feedback was also of interest, right? Because it's clear that if we only provide partial feedback, then that's going to force the exploration exploitation trade-off. If we provide full feedback, then that removes that need for that, for that exploration. And therefore, the adaptation to change might be better because we can observe the outcome of the other option. But interestingly, Ratko and Meyer use full feedback. So the potential trend effect may not be due to the type of feedback, but we don't know, right? Abrahami uh, et al. also in 2016 actually compared directly partial and full, full feedback, and they did so in volatile environments. I want to clarify that volatile environments are not the same as dynamic trend environments, right? So they did something with variable environments, but not looking at the dynamic trend environment. But they did find that with full feedback, there is a greater preference for the riskier option. So there is really uh, um, no clear expectation about the effect of full feedback, but just uh, thinking uh, from the observational point of view, um, the more feedback we give, the full feedback should uh, provide better adaptation to change. So in these studies, we look at these two variables, the trend and the feedback manipulations. And we look at the two variables in the two uh, papers, but in a slightly different way. In the Constantinides et al. paper, uh, what we did is we had one static uh, safe option that provided 250 points with probability one, and a risky option that um, provided zero with probability 0 0.5 and 500 with a probability that change over time, okay? In the McCormick et al., we gave two risky instead of a safe and a risky option to eliminate the issue of, or oh, perhaps they are just risk averse, right? So we use these two um, gambles, and again, the probability change in three different conditions. The first one is fixed over time. So basically they are choosing two options that are the same. The other one changes the probability from 0 0.01 to one, that's the increasing condition. The decreasing condition changes from one to 0 0.01 uh, over the course of 100 trials. Importantly, the expected value of all these uh, gambles is the same, uh, 250. So the objective switch um, is what matters, right? To see whether they adapted to change and the objective switch happens exactly at trial 50. I have a qu qu clarification question, quick one. Yes. Uh, if the probability of the risky is uh, 0 0.50 for sure, how the probability of 500 can change? I assume I missed something. Like the probability of 500 is the one that changes. Yeah, so, but it's either zero or 500? Correct, zero or 500, correct. So with, if it's fixed to 0.5, then this probability should also be fixed to 0.5. Yes, you are correct. So this is, this is, um, no, no, no. Only the it's probability. One six, no? Only the probability of 500 changes over time in a way that one option is better than the other at the beginning, right? Um, this option is better than this one at the beginning because the probability of getting 500 is only 0 0.01. So but the probability then, of zero is 0.9. It's one minus one six. Minus six. Yeah, one minus six. Okay, so and there then, is. And then at the end, the other option becomes more, um, um, it becomes a better option over time. That's okay. So the the other um, the other uh, variable that we look at is the feedback. And this part here shows how we presented the feedback. You all know now the partial feedback. You only get the um, option that you selected and the full feedback. 
you also get the outcome of the other option in each trial. So in a way that you could see over time, right, how uh, presumably if you select the, the risky option, how the probabilities are changing. Um, so this was a three times two design. To uh, spoil the results uh, right up front, um, in the two experiments, what we saw is that adaptation was slower in the increasing uh, trend than the decreasing trend. And this effect persists with the risky options and also with full feedback, which was very surprising, but um, uh, I think it is quite robust. So here, what we are going to see are the results from the Constantinidis et al. paper. You first see um, in this row the, the proportion of risky options. In this row, you see the, um, the maximization proportions. And you clearly see that in the increasing condition, there is this gap of adaptation in the decreasing conditions right on top of the change of the probability. You also see that in the, uh, in the proportion of maximization, you see that the increasing condition after the change, um, you see a proportion of maximization that is lower than in the decreasing condition. Meaning again, in the decreasing condition, participants are able to adapt better their choices to that change than in the increasing condition, regardless of the feedback. But Cody, I'm kind of surprised that they learn in a partial condition to inc the increase because uh, you, you would expect that they, they will have this hot stove effect and which will make them not sampling the risky option, right? But they do adapt. Uh, not as, as we wish they would, right? But they do adapt. So once in a while, right, they, um, they get to sample the other option and then they start to figure out that things are changing. But as you can see, right, at, uh, when the objective um, change of the two options happens, they are still pretty much uh, selecting the same option, right? So, so they don't adapt as much as we want them to. But they are not notified that there is a change in the environment. They have no, no idea. No, they are not notified of any change at all. Um, nothing at all other than you are making choices between you know two options and you are paid for um, the points that you accumulate over the task. So in the McCormick et al. Uh, paper, the results were presented slightly different, but as um, you can see, this is the increasing condition. This is the dec decreasing condition, partial feedback and full feedback. And so you can see first immediately increasing versus decreasing by looking at this gap. The, this gap before and after the change is smaller in the decreasing than in the increasing condition, right? And you can also see that the feedback slightly helped, but not enough, right? There is still a problem uh, with adaptation in this case. So in general, adaptation is poor. Uh, that is the maximization rate is higher before the change than after the change, regardless of the uh, feedback. And the trend uh, effect is robust. The adaptation is better uh, when the risks become less rewarding uh, over time than when the risks become more rewarding over time, even with full feedback. Now, we wanted to look at the individual uh, behavior. And to do that, what we, um, what we did, sorry, what we did is to um, code the proportion of maximization before the change and after the change for each individual. So, and we sort of gave names to each of the four uh, quadrants. So the um, agile quadrant and the clumsy quadrant are people that uh, switch their behavior, right from the first 50 trials to the second 50 trials. So the agile participants were making good decisions, the best option before the change. 
And then they shift the, the option to continue making good decisions after the change. So that's what this quadrant means. Um, the uh, rigid quadrant means people that are making good optimal decisions before they change, but then they sort of stick to the same option, right? And they end up making bad decisions after the change, after the switch, okay? So what we want is to reduce this number of rigid people, but we see that actually that's the most common. So people are uh, very uh, rigid compared to agile, right? Uh, in all the, the conditions. And fortunate are those who made bad decisions and started to do good decisions? The fortunate start with bad decisions, right? Before the change is less than 50% maximization. And then uh, they move to good decisions, but without switching. So basically they were just, just fortunate, okay? And uh, of course the clumsy, you see that there are only a few points here because are, these are the people that are making um, bad decisions before the change and also bad decision after the change by switching. That would be pretty stupid. And so there are very few of those people. So we also look at the beliefs um, in, in different ways in the Konstantinidis and in the McCormick pa uh, paper. Um, so we look at the, their beliefs through surveys. In the Constantinidis paper, we basically classify participants based on their awareness of the change. We basically ask them uh, for their awareness of the change. Only 53, about 53% of participants overall were actually aware that there was a change. Um, and they were close to identifying the trial in which the objective change occurred. Interestingly, I found this interesting, although it's just an observation. What we found is that uh, of those participants that were aware of the change, those that were given full feedback, they thought that the change occurred earlier than it really happened. And those that received partial feedback, they thought that the change occurred later than it really happened. So I, I just think that's an interesting observation. Um, in the other uh, paper by McCormick et al., what we did is we um, asked them for their relative value. So do you think that the stationary uh, uh, option is better than the non-stationary or the other way around, right? And what we observe is a general tendency to believe that the initially better option had greater value overall. So you can see that the increasing condition, the um, most people thought that the stationary option was better than the non-stationary overall. In the decreasing condition, most people thought that the non-stationary was better than the stationary overall. So these are the conditions that were better initially. Okay, so um, I don't know how am I doing in time. I hope good, because I still have some stuff to say. Um, yeah, you have at least uh, 15, 20 more minutes. All right, so summary of the phenomena up to now, adaptation is poor, maximization rate is higher before the change than after the change. The trend effect is robust, adaptation is better when risks become less rewarding over time then when risks become more rewarding over time, even with full feedback, there is some um, sense that rigidity or stickiness uh, is a major problem for adaptation. So participants have incorrect beliefs and we see objectively that they do follow sort of the stickiness um, situation more commonly. So, but this is only establishing the phenomena. We are not really explaining why do our people reach it? Uh, why can't they adapt to change? So we offer two explanations or, um, you know, hopes for improving this rigidity situation in dynamic environments. The first one is the uh, explicit observation of change. So in our experiments, we know that the continuous change in probability is really not observable. 
it's only observable if you select that option, right? And it's um, the probability is really not explicitly given to participants. What is given to participants is the outcome, not the probabilities. So we, uh, we are gonna address that issue. And the second explanation is memory. So we know that uh, memory is necessary to hold these sequential patterns of observations over time and to monitor the change. But we also know that our memory is imperfect. We forget things, we confuse the experiences, we distort probabilities, we do all these things with our memories. And so um, what is the effect of memory? Is it memory that causes this rigidity? Better memory capacity has actually been found to be a good predictor of choice performance, but in static environments. Is better memory also necessary or helpful in dynamic environments? Um, in groups, what we found is that um, there can be detrimental, it can be detrimental to adaptation to change where uh, recency actually is um, more expected. And also that was sort of confirmed in, a, in the other study that I mentioned before by Abraham in 2016. Thus, we think that in dynamic environments, actually future decisions may be best informed by the more recent experiences. And it does make uh, sense um, if the environment is changing continuously, if we rely on the more recent experiences, we should be able to adapt better. So let's address the first explanation first, the explicit observation of change. So in this case, what we did, and also part of the McCormick paper, is we actually didn't change the probability. We kept the probability the same, and we changed the outcome because the outcome is the one that is observed. Again, taking care that these gambles still have the same overall expected value of 250 as before. So we see that in the dynamic outcome, we have three conditions, one constant, essentially the two options are exactly the same, one increasing in which the outcome changes from 10, 10 points in every trial over 100 trial to 1,000, one option a decreasing condition in which the outcome changes for one, from 1,000 to 10 points, 10 points change in every trial. Again, we use the two types of feedback. Of course, in this case, you see now more clearly the outcome in the case of the full feedback, you see at uh, trial 10, you would have gotten 100 for, from option B in uh, this particular increasing condition, okay? So these are the results. Um, what we observe here is the same kind of uh, figure that I showed before. This is the increasing, the decreasing, partial, and uh, full uh, feedback. And what you see here is the, um, uh, I think my pointer stop working now. So what you observe here is that um, the, the trend effect is still there, uh, although slightly uh, less so than before. So you see here in the increasing condition versus the decreasing, the decreasing actually was slightly better in this case of partial feedback. Um, but I mean, the, the um, adaptation problem is still there. You can still see that um, the proportion of maximization is lower after the change than before the change. Interestingly, even with the full feedback, which makes it very obvious what the other outcome is gonna be, and now the observed outcome is, um, is the, um, the observation is the outcome, which um, again, makes it interesting. We do see that there is a, a, a decrease in the rigidity proportion and moving most participants towards the agile. 
So the observation, uh, the, the actual explicit observation of the change in the outcome does help reduce this rigidity. It didn't help much in this particular condition, but in all the other conditions, there are less individuals that are considered rigid and more that are agile. So the, um, um, now if I can change my, okay, screen. Uh, so the conclusions of this explicit observation to change is the adaptation uh, continues to be mostly poor, uh, but explicit observation uh, of change helps make people less rigid. Full feedback helps adaptation when the risk becomes less rewarding over time in one of those cases. Okay, let's move on to memory effects at this as the second explanation. And this is a uh, work reported in the uh, Constantinidis 2022 paper. Here we use cognitive models to incorporate or to understand uh, memory and learning uh, processes. And those models that are able to incorporate these memory processes can help explain these differences in the, in the trends. Um, essentially, the questions are, is better memory that is slow for getting a good predictor of adaptation, or is recency quick for getting relating, related to better adaptation? So what we did is we found the best fitting parameters to each individual in our data sets using two types of computational models, instance-based learning model of binary choice and reinforcement, reinforcing, uh, reinforcement learning. We actually use two types of reinforcing learning models. Um, I'm mostly gonna talk about one of them. The results are the same for both type of RL models. Let's go with the instance-based learning uh, model. The IBL model of binary choice is just one particular example of a type of model that we can construct using the theory, instance-based instance learning theory. The theory provides uh, an algorithm for how decisions are made, made from experience. The algorithm provides explicit um, steps um, and also formalizations of the processes by which we make these, these decisions. It assumes that we make decisions by recognizing similar past experiences, integrating those experiences to generate an expected utility value of the various alternatives, and then selecting the option that has the maximum expected value. So those experiences are saved in instances that have um, features, contextual values, action, and outcome. We rely on the activation equation of ACTAR to determine the um, retrieval of each of those instances from memory based on frequency, recency, and noise. And then we blend the uh, values of the various alternatives and we select the option that has the maximum blended value. So generally that's the process for every IBL model, particularly for the instance-based learning model of binary choice, which was reported in many papers. Um, it's, it's a very simple model because the task is simple. So we only have two options, A and B, and um, in this particular example, there are three possible instances that can be stored. There are no features because there is nothing that differentiates the two options. So there is three instances, A4, A0, B3. And this is the process by which decisions are made. The first step is to calculate the um, activation then we calculate the probability of retrieval based on the activation value. Then we calculate the blended value of the option relying on that probability. Finally, we select the option that has the maximum blended value. So what is important for this paper is um, 
the recency parameter. This parameter, the higher it is, the more recent experiences are considered. Um, the second model, the RL model, is in fact similar to um, IBL in many ways in the sense that, for example, it's a closed loop learning loop in which the agent le learns from the observations of the environment and uh, uh, executes an action that may change the environment. But in this case, this type of model creates uh, an expectation for each of the option um, that's E and updates that expectation based on the observed uh, reward. Um, there are tons of reinforcement learning variation models, uh, but in this case, this is the, the most uh, well known and it in fact has been used quite a lot extensively for um, uh, um, decisions from experienced tasks. So this expectancy value is the sum of the previous trial expectancy, the prediction uh, and the prediction um, error, which is essentially the difference between the reward and the previous expectancy. The parameter that is of relevance for us here is the fee uh, parameter. The higher the fee parameter, the more recent experiences are used. Okay, model fitting results. Um, so here I'm presenting the two um, the two RL models, but essentially the results are the same. So what we can see here is that all the models reproduce the main behavioral observation, meaning the slow adaptation and also the slow adaptation in the increasing uh, condition and the faster adaptation in the decreasing condition. Um, but I think most interestingly is, of course, the um, exploration of the parameters, right, and the distributions of the parameters. So here I'm only showing the D parameter and the phi parameter of the uh, one RL model that I presented. And as you can see, the effect is very consistent. Um, in the decreasing condition, we have a higher D parameter, more recent, uh, more recent experiences. And in the um, increasing condition, we have a lower D parameter, lower phi parameter. So across two models that were independently developed, independently fit to the data, we see the consistency of the effect of um, the recency um, in, in the performance, right? So to make it more direct and indeed to figure out whether indeed um, uh, adaptive participants have higher IBL recency parameter and RLP parameter, what we did is we um, separated participants into adaptive or non-adaptive based on the maximization performance in the last 30 trials, which that would give you know, more chance for those that are slow to adapt. Um, so we analyzed those adaptive and non-adaptive participants in their parameters. And what we see here is that the adaptive participants in both conditions, the adaptive participants have a higher D than the non-adaptive participants. And again, that's across, across all the, um, the conditions. But then we also wanted to know, and this was more exploratory, um, how would individual, so is this D or phi parameters an individual feature, or is this, is this a mix of the particular environment in which they are um, assigned to? So how would individuals that have a high or low recency value would adapt to a different condition of change? Okay, so if, if recency is really relevant for adaptation and if memory, if we have a recency parameter, um, you know, then what we should see is that individuals that have a high um, recency parameter should be able to detect the change in conditions 
that are different from which that parameter was found, right? So what we did is we used this calibration and simulation in a new condition, and then we split participants into um, high and low recency parameters. So for example, in this case, we um, took participants that were fit to the decreasing condition, and we simulated those participants in the increasing condition. So this particular figure here shows the increasing condition when the um, participants are separated into high recency and low recency participants. Overall, the main point is that you can see in all of these transfer conditions, participants with high recency are the ones that adapt better to novel conditions. This, of course, still needs to be verified empirically. Conclusions on memory effect. The recency can explain the trend effect. So across the two different models, the results are consistent. Individuals in the decreasing conditions have higher IBL recency and RL fee parameters than individuals in the increasing condition. And generally more adaptive individuals have higher IBL recency and RL fee parameters. And our exploratory generalizations also suggest that this recency might be an individual uh, factor. That is, people with high recency uh, are expected to adapt better in novel situations. And this is my overall conclusion, essentially a statement of the phenomena and explanations. The phenomena are that uh, humans adapt poorly to continuous change. Uh, there is a trend effect, meaning that risks that become more rewarding over time are harder to detect compared to risks that become less rewarding over time. The full feedback is not going to fully improve this asymmetry. The rigidity is a major problem for adaptation. So people tend to believe that an initially better option is uh, the best option overall. And the explanations slash hopes for improvement of these issues is first the explicit observation of change that can make people less rigid, but it doesn't fully uh, improve adaptation. And also memory. So individuals that rely on more recent experiences are more successful in adapting to change. So we can perhaps highlight those um, more recent experiences more. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. If you are interested in um, getting our IBL um, framework to, um, to use it for your modeling, you can download either Pebble, uh, Python IBL, or Speedy IBL, which is a much faster version. And we are using it currently to interact with humans in real time. So if you are interested, just let me know. And Thank you so much. It was very interesting. And now I open the floor for questions. And I see we already have one, already two. Uh, so can I go ahead? And I just wanted to ask you, so recency can explain that, but what leads people to have higher recency in the decreasing versus uh, increasing environment? So what is the mechanism that leads people? So you use different parameter for recency for these different environments. But why should this parameter change? Or maybe I missed something. Um, it's, it's essentially used just as an explanation, right? So we are fitting individuals in each of the two conditions. And we are establishing that in the decreasing condition, there is a higher D, meaning that people in that condition are relying in more recent experiences, uh, while in the increasing condition, they are not, right? So it's basically an explanation of the, the result. Um, then, like, your question is about where the parameter or why, why, why do we, so what in the mechanism, what in the cognitive mechanism lead us to different parameters of recency in this environment? So 
so uh, I guess I am not sure um, how to answer the question. So the the uh, method that we followed is uh, the traditional method for um, explaining uh, decisions in like Bayesian models, right? So you just look at the fit and the fit is what are the, the value of that parameter that optimizes a particular outcome, right? And so it's, it's a simple explanation of the phenomena. So I'm no, no, not... I, I, I understand what you find and it's really interesting. I'm just thinking aloud and thinking what, what could make us be more sensitive to recent experiences in this environment while not in the other? Like what is the mechanism inside? Anyway, we can talk about it later. So yeah, the, the uh, no, I think that's interesting. The, the, the generalization exercise suggests that is, uh, is an individual parameter, meaning, you know, just like you have blue eyes and I have brown eyes, you can have a higher uh, D and I have a lower D. That's no, but I'm, uh, but I, I'm thinking, for example, I'll do the work about uh, loss of tension. Maybe when you decrease the environment, you have you feel some kind of losses, and then you have more tension, and then you have a recency stronger, and or, or kind of confirmation bias that becomes less uh, severe. What happened there that makes us more sensitive? Anyway, we no, can that, talk that... about it. <laughs> that is absolutely the case, right? So in the in the decreasing condition, you have a direct observation because you start selecting from the option that is changing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you start selecting the option that is changing, and therefore that gives you more uh, awareness of the change, um, you know, than when you start with the other option. So that's that's absolutely true. The interesting okay. thing is that even with the full feedback in the increasing condition, that doesn't help for people to understand that they should change when this shift occurs. So then you need to assume more attention to the obtained payoff and not then to foregone payoffs, right? That's also a good point. Our models, uh, none of the models, neither the RL or the IBL, made any difference between the observed and the foregone payoffs, okay? So we simply assume that everything that is observed is, um, is as if you had experienced it, basically, right? Uh, but that's, that's a good point and that could be something for uh, to explore more in the future, right? Uh, whether indeed the attention is different in the foregone than in the experienced. Um, yeah. May, may I say something on this, if if I if I may? So, I think what you're looking for, Kinarit, is similar to what you suggested earlier about hot stove effects, right? So, people start the task in the uh, increasing condition. They don't realize that the risky option is changing, right? They keep selecting from the safe option, which gives the same outcome, right? It's 250. So, the recency parameter there, or whatever you want to call it, uh, decay or whatever, is smaller because there's nothing to really update. So in the case of parcel feedback, there's no really updating. So that's why the parameter, at least at the early stages of the task, tracks this uh, stability in the environment. When you have full feedback, though, there is some movement. But again, the, even with full feedback, people do not switch as fast or uh, efficiently as in the uh, in the decreasing condition. So I don't know if that answers part of the question, but it's a combination of hot stop effects, limited updating, and uh, a smaller decay. Hassan, your turn. Thank you so much. This was a really, really interesting talk. Um, my question was uh, is sort of similar to Kinneret's. It's you've got this experience and uh, the, and description gap right so and you've got this difference in probability in, in gains and in losses like in when things are going down and when things are going up so do you think that um weighting of events might be a more important way of looking at things instead of looking at recency so the fact that something seems worse in a certain way because of a certain expected value so can you apply like a reference point in a prop 
prospect theory sort of a, an approach to to something like this? Um, so I am not looking at all at, at descriptive choices here, right? I'm only looking at experiential choices. I'm not looking at all at gains versus losses. I'm looking at changes over time and I'm looking at changes of probabilities over time or outcomes over time, right? So I have a hard time connecting it to prospect theory at all. Uh, so, I mean, so I was just thinking that the reference point in the prospect theory, what is zero could be say the other gamble or like the mean of the last few gambles. So it's not that you're actually experiencing a loss, but just because it seems like a loss compared to what it could have been, you sort of have a certain pattern which comes up. So it, well, Okay, so that, that's a good point, but it has nothing to do with prospect theory. It's the fact that we make um, choices in relative terms, meaning you, know, you are looking at one option versus the other and what the, the two options is better. The two options are better, right? Now, importantly, in, in, my, in our experiments, all the options were of the same expected value. So there is no difference in the expected value. The expected value changes over time because the probability or the outcome is changing. But overall, the objectively, as prospect theory would see it by description, um, the, the value of the options was the same. OK, OK. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, the results are very interesting. Uh, the fact that there's a small difference between the foregone and the full feedback is as uh, a partial and the full feedback is really interesting. There obviously is a natural explanation of this result would be hot stop effect, but obviously the hot, well, your results of this hot stop effect is not very strong here. I want to, and maybe what I'm saying is a little bit similar to what Kinnert is suggesting. Uh, Personally, I think recency, uh, you know, we have papers that show that there's little recency effect, at least when there's rare events. Uh, in one of uh, my papers with Doran Cohen, who's here in Ophir, uh, we explained some results with a small sample, and then um, as a researcher criticized us and said that you can explain the results by assuming recency. And they fitted some model that they fit the data well by assuming recency, but when we look at the data, we couldn't find this recency. So my feeling is that recency is sometimes overrated if you limit yourself to specific models that can only capture the data with recency. I'm not sure if this is the case in your data, but it would be good to look at the data and see if you actually have the recency uh, by the sequential dependencies, not in the parameter, is a parameter, uh, recency may not be correlated with the observed recency for per, per individual. This is what happened in our data set with a rare event. Mm -hmm. But uh, but here is an, uh, my favorite explanation, which is some people, which what was already said here, but I think that when things getting better, say everything is good, I don't have to worry. Life is good, God likes me, I do something right. You know, I'm trying, uh, maybe I'm here even more dynamic than you. You know, when, when you uh, in your early research talk about dynamic, it's not only dynamics that the world is changing, but maybe I'm changing the world. So whatever I do is good because now uh, the risky option become even better. So I should continue what I'm doing. And once in a while, I select the risky and getting even better. When things get bad, say, hey, hey, what I'm doing here is not so good. Uh, and uh, so you don't have to assume prospect theory to do that. This is a natural thing. This is what I do when things get worse. You know, something is wrong here. My my battery is off. You know, something I should do something uh, something to correct it. Uh, so yeah, my but, my um, feeling is uh, that subject may be even more dynamic than you assume in this paper, but more is what you assume early in your career. Yeah, I guess one several points here to make. I guess one is. Um, you shouldn't assume that things are gonna always uh, go well just because they have been going well <laughs> up to a point, right? So, um, so changes are of both types, exogenous and endogenous, right? So changes can be out of your control, 
And it's true that you are also influencing that, but there are many things. I, I, I do believe that what goes around comes around. Uh, that's just my general sense. But the question is how big that loop is uh, for something to come back to you. And so when that loop is very long, um, it can be considered an exogenous event. So you don't have a lot of control over that. That's one, one general comment. Um, and of course, the, if that was the case, um, you know, you would basically behave like we have observed in the increasing probability condition, which is you would not adapt because things are going well with a safe option. Why would I go to the other option? So you would not realize the change and you will miss the opportunity to make a better money after the, the shift. So I think you, you would be that, uh, that uh, type of participant in our experiment. Um, so the other thing is in, in terms of the rare event, I think that's very interesting because I believe that relates to the sudden change versus gradual change. So, you know, in this case, we are looking at gradual change. I do strongly believe that recency based on our evidence is important, but is it equally important important when there is a sudden change, which I believe relates more to the rare events. Um, you know, that would be interesting to look at, um, you know, the, the sudden versus gradual change is a dimension that hasn't been investigated uh, yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. so now it's the time for those who have to leave to live and we have to thank Koti and those who want to stay and continue the discussion for a few more minutes are more than welcome to stay with us. Ido, you wanted to say something else? I'm sorry I was in the middle of your sentence. Thank you. Um, no, no, I, I didn't. I will stay for a minute if uh, Koti has time. Yeah, All that's right. okay. I can stay. Thanks. Um, so I have a a uh, more technical question. You said that the, both uh, um, type of models uh, uh, capture this asymmetry between increasing and decreasing, but the, the, you, you treat all payoffs as if they were experienced. So I'm not sure how, how is that happening? What's the mechanism in the model that does that? If the recency is, is, is constant? Well, basically in the model, you start to, in the IBL model, I think it's the same for the RL, but I'm really glad that Manos is here. Um, so basically you just store two instances at the same time. So you store the instance of the experience outcome and you store the instance of the non-experience outcome. No, but I'm asking how is it possible that the model predicts this asymmetry because the, the asymmetry of increasing versus decreasing because it's the same thing, right? Um, or or what, am, what am I missing here? It's ridiculous. Or the model is the same thing different parameters right for the recency so the the fit was um the participants were different the, the parameters were fit to each uh, of the two separate conditions the parameters are going to be different in in uh, both but, conditions so there's no mechanism in the model that captures this asymmetry it's all it's all about no. the different parameter of the model fitted to the condition well, everything is emergent in these models. It's not, it's not a rule-based um, model, right? So everything is emergent. And in this case, yes, we see that the parameters are different in the two conditions. Okay, thanks. I, I, I thought I missed something about uh, how the model were fitted. But, but let me just good. continue this line. Could it be, Cody, for example, if you assume more attention to the obtained payoff uh, than to the foregone payoff, that the recency parameter would be the same. You would be able to have the same recency parameter and, and you will get some kind of hot stuff even in the um, full feedback design due to the attention part for the obtain. That's, that's, what I, that's what I thought you did. That's how I thought I, you captured the symmetry, but so. No, but I think that's an interesting point. Um, certainly, you know, that's the, the huge benefit of having a model is uh, a, a toy in the playground, right? You can, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, 
and that is possible to to investigate. By the way, I forgot to say the data, everything is available in open science if anyone wants to look at the, the data for both papers. Manos, you gave up on your question or comment? Well, well kind of. No, I, I wanted to make a comment uh, about what Ido suggested earlier, that um, it's interesting because in our case, in, in the paper I was involved, we had a safe versus risky option, whereas in the other paper was risky versus risky, right? To to outcome gambles. Now, the case is that in our case, I think the effect is stronger in uh, compared to when you have to choose between two risky options. And I think this is consistent with what you said, basically, that people are risk averse in, in gains, and then they need much more evidence to switch from this neutral state of just choosing the safe option, which is going to give me 250 for sure, versus the other one, which is variable. Now, this effect is not emerging as strong uh, in the other group. So if you if you go and um, have a look in the paper, we have we compare actually the data from the, from the two papers, and we show that the effect is not stronger in in the other in the in the two by two uh, example. Um, which, which is interesting, right, by itself, like the composition of the decision environment can change how fast or, or slow you adapt to these to these changes, which we didn't uh, directly uh, uh, explain. Uh, the, the other thing is, is the model, uh, and I completely agree with, with both comments about making the models able to account for this, but I suppose the the hot stove effect, and I don't really like this parameter about putting more attention to the foregone or the obtained outcome, uh, similar to, for example, to what Eldad has done in the past, where they have a single parameter weighting parameter ranging from zero to one, and then you can see. I don't know. I don't think it's too much. Um, I don't, it doesn't really explain much to me this this idea and they, they, there have been a couple of papers right I don't think it's very identifiable these weighting parameters um also it, at least theoretically practically yes they can be but theoretically I don't know I think I think there is there's uh, uh there are results showing that with uh, uh so process data of of uh, uh um, gaze that shows that people are paying attention less to uh to foregone payoffs. So why would it, why wouldn't it be reasonable theoretically? Because, for example, there is another paper that I've read by uh, Tim Reiko and uh, Nathan Ashby, where they do that, and then they find that people after I don't know twenty trials they stop looking, right? And they, they which, which, which is another explanation for these results, by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. It could be, it could be, it could be the, the status quo and everything. So, uh, yeah. It, it's not like we we started from this theoretical point and then we said, well, let's not include that parameter into the model, right? It's not like we're trying to now to defend ourselves. No, we, we started with a simple model and say like whether recency or simple updating mechanisms can potentially show this differential effect, which can then, of course, be attributed to many other things, can be attributed to host of effects, which was there, but it's not the only, as we show in the paper it was not the only explanations for explanation for our results because you, in the full feedback one where technically you won't have this hot stop effect you don't see you don't you still see this this trend this increasing um slow adaptation in the increasing environment so um yeah but very very interesting uh, points i would say and then there's this, this other the nominal outcome effect right which is we used very uh well it was the the outcomes was in the hundreds right and the question is because i i really enjoy magnitude effects i really i'm really interested in those what would happen if the the outcomes were in in the tens or 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 less you know to account for diminished sensitivity and all of that i think one of our um one of our reviewers actually made a good point that I would like to bring up now, which uh, essentially is it depends on um, you know the the value of recency depends on what the trends of the change are, and in our case we really have only touched the surface of the possibilities here, right? So we are doing 
continuously increasing in linear ways or continuously decreasing in linear ways. But the world is not that linear, right? So, um, so the changes might occur in nonlinear ways, actually most commonly. And so the question is, in which um, situations is the recency more uh, relevant? Um, you know, and it's clearly, you know, if if the if the world is linear, if the world were uh, was linear, um, of course, the more recent ones make more sense to rely on, right? But when you have um, nonlinear world, not necessarily. So I do want to explore this a little bit more, and you know, I appreciate that reviewer that brought that 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 issue, although we only discussed it and we didn't address it in our paper. But anyway, just to to so play I, devil's advocate too. Yeah. I, I wasn't your reviewer, but uh so I, I wonder if but if you did do some experiments with uh changes, even if you keep the linear thing, but you have like decreased and increased in something that is not uh, so stable within condition. Have you had the chance to, to do something like that? Um, so the one we have currently data for is uh, nonlinear change, um, but still the trends are the same because we still want to continue investigating the trend. So what, what I mean is uh, we have functions in which the increase is um, in, in, a, in a nonlinear function, the decrease is in a nonlinear function. Um, but still we have these uh, decreasing or increasing uh, trends. We know from, from dynamic systems and um, dynamic tasks that the world is usually um, changes in, in nonlinear ways and humans assume is usually linear change. And that's why it's so difficult to adapt to many situations in the world. So that's sort of the aspect that we are pursuing now. But there, again, there are so many things to do. But I think one, one important point here is not what we think that the change is, but what the participants and what people believe what the change is. And, you know, there is a uh, lot of evidence, uh, including uh, a lot of uh, recent evidence that people perceive the environment, even if it's static, to be dynamic, right? And all yes. about exploitation of patterns. So I think it makes a lot of sense to actually gauge what participants really believe. Uh, and I suppose Ben presented here a couple of weeks, a month ago, or uh, when was it? A couple of months ago, about this that uh, non probabilistic elements and people explore uh, patterns. You, uh, the work from from your from your lab shows that as well. So I think it's. It, it, it's about time to go and actually gauge people's perspective of how uh, they perceive the environment and whether, for example, even the change is logarithmic or quadratic, whether they, you know, translate it or transform it into something that is meaningful for them. Um, of course, I more than agree. Uh, I would even take it if you have a few minutes more, but if you're tight on time, we can talk about it later. Yeah. yeah sure. um, we have in our paper with Ori and Ido, uh, we have a, a model that talks about regularities and we have, it wasn't able to fit uh, uh, the data. So uh, like we, we had to post hoc add some assumption about the trend, which is what you are talking about. Mm -hmm. So for those that are not familiar, we're talking about the fact that people try to think, uh, think perceive the world, even if it's static, perceive the world to be dynamic, that there are some regularities. So if I just saw an event, a rare event usually, I think that is now it's less probable to have this event occur again. Uh, and this kind of regularities is not, I wondered uh, when you presented the IBL approach, I wondered if you can maybe account for these regularities and not only, the trending is by the recency, that's I understand. But the regularities, maybe you can, Account if in the IBM model in the similarities of the state. So you you suggested that when you have two keys, you have one state, but maybe the regularity in our models can be captured or or can be uh, simulated in the IBL approach uh, by saying that the, the the last outcomes determine the the, the state. 
Mm. Yeah, then uh, the, the question here is what what is the state? What are the attributes that describe the state? Uh, because you know the, the thing is in the binary choice task, the world is oversimplified also, right? So we don't really have attributes there to rely on. So what is what is the state in your task? So what we suggested our model do is taking the last sequence of outcome and if it was let's say zero zero one so this the state now is zero zero one i'm looking back and only on zero zero ones what happened after that so right. the state is determined according to the last sequence of outcome okay yeah so for example in rock paper scissors uh game my colleague uh christian Lebier, that's the way he has um accounted for the sequences of, of actions is by representing explicitly the previous actions. Um, and yeah, we, we can do that too. In, you know, in, in any IBL model, we can represent the state as a sequence of, of previous actions. Okay. And it's possible that that indeed would, would um, sort of account for these regularities. And I, I think that's super interesting because indeed we, that's how we learn, right? Is by observing the regularities in the environment. Yes. Okay, as I promised you at the beginning of the talk, this talk was very inspiring. And I will end with a half a joke question. Uh, you, you're, in your conclusion, you said that we are bad at adapting, right? But on the other hand, you started the presentation with the um, with the notion that when we are shopping a few years ago, or 10 years ago, we were not shopping online. And now most of us are shopping online, which is a bit contradicting to what you are saying, because it hints that we are adapting very well to the environment. So how do you make sense of these two things? Yeah, so I mean, in question. general, the, the point is that um, in general, people are bad at adapting. And yeah, we might think in the case of the shopping that everyone is shopping online, but that's not the case, even though it's indeed very, um, you know, it, it can be cost effective, uh, it can be fast, and now you can do returns, etc. I mean, you know, we, uh, I, I can bet that not a lot of people or not most people are gonna be um, shopping online. So the question is the adaptation, right? Whether, whether yeah. people realize which option is better. I have just an extension of that, uh, that I think that some of the older uh, decision from experienced people are just uh, like myself, are just like your, uh, how do you call it? Fortunate subject in your experiment. You know, we start uh, study decision from the experience when it was really no one say where in life you click and make decisions. Now the world has changed in our field actually have some. Uh, so we have, I have not changed, but luckily, but I think I was a little <laughs> bit fortunate. The world move in our direction. Let's hope that the reviewer will understand that too. Uh, this is the case. The reviewer is a little bit slower to understand, but I think that we were fortunate. <laughs> so I really like those subjects. Yeah, you don't do not anything, just the, the world plays for you nicely. So that's good. <laughs> yes. Okay, that was good. fun. Let's hope you will be fortunate in the future too. This is yeah. excellent talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really moving you in that. our direction. Yeah, thank you very okay, much. Fun, nice nice to, to see, see everyone. Thanks, Manu. Good to bye see you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you so much.